subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscribe button. Click the bell button and enjoy the latest uploads from our channel. Jinnah and uh, Jawaharlal Nehru agreed to establish Hindu-dominated India and Muslim-dominated Pakistan. They hoped it might bring an end to ethnic violence and herald a new beginning for the region. However, what happened in reality has been continuous conflict even till today, especially in Kashmir. How come the two sides have yet to resolve their differences in seven decades? Will they need another 70 years to do so? Joining me in the discussion today is Atul Aneja, China correspondent of The Hindu. And from Islamabad, we have Sultan Hali, a writer and security analyst. But first First, let's take a quick look at this history of the partition. At the stroke of midnight on August 14, 1947, the British broke the British Indian Empire into two sovereign states, India and Pakistan. Pakistan marks its independence on August 14, and India's celebrations come a day later. The creation of the two countries disrupted millions of lives. Pakistan was mostly Muslim, while India was majority Hindu. A mass migration followed. Violence and bloodshed persisted as about 15 million Muslims, Hindus, and Sikhs, fearing discrimination, swapped countries. The upheaval left at least one million dead. Pakistan and India have fought three wars since 1947, and their relations remain tense, particularly over the disputed Himalayan region of Kashmir, which both countries claim in full. And let's begin our discussions. And uh, many thanks for the two gentlemen for joining us. Mr. Anajah, let me come to you first. Why are the two sides still uh, not having peace with each other 70 years after their partition? Well, there are several factors why we have not achieved peace. Uh, and, part, and it begins with history, really, the historical factors, which uh, the, the very fact of the partition which you mentioned and the, and the uh, bitterness that it caused at a people-to-people -people level. Uh, so that has been an enduring memory. But uh, having said that, uh, I think there's a parallel process as well starting uh, with the new generation coming in both countries, uh, uh, which does not have those bitter memories uh, of, of what their forefathers, or, the, or at least what their fathers had experienced. So there are, they, they, it's not a single narrative which is going on between India and Pakistan, though dominantly still, we have yet to uh, erase uh, the conflictual element within our relationship, which yeah. is still, still, still dominant. So but there are, there are hopeful signs as well. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hali, what is the Pakistani take on this issue? Well, uh, you, you see, there were certain scars that were left behind. In fact, what happened was that the British, perhaps uh, uh, by uh, intent, they left a certain unfinished agenda, like Kashmir you mentioned in the opening of the program, uh, is an unfinished agenda. Because uh, what happened was that uh, uh, now we, uh, what we thought earlier as uh, something of uh, a myth has been proved that the, uh, the line of partition was uh, distorted at the behest of Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru by uh, Lord Mountbatten, who leaned hard on Sir Cyril Radcliffe, who was in charge of the Boundary Commission. His secretary, uh, uh, Lord B Beaumont, he died about six years back, and his grandnephew has published his diaries, which uh, prove that uh, Lord Mountbatten had actually forced Sir R Cyril Radcliffe to uh, distort the boundaries. And because of the distortion in the boundaries, India got ac access, uh, ground access to Kashmir, which uh, left uh, the Kashmir, uh, the Himalayan province, which was supposed to be, uh, you know, governed by a Hindu Maharaja, and the people were supposed to decide their own fate. Uh, so uh, he he was coerced to sign a letter of accession to the Indians, so, and that is yeah. the reason why we had the first war in 1947. So, Mr. Halley, you're and talking about that, the historical Pakistan reason about war. yes, yes. Let me let me give a little bit of time for the Indian guests to respond to what you're just saying. Uh, what is the British responsibility in the process, Mr. Anija, and uh, could it have been done differently? I think so. Uh, I think uh, uh, Radcliffe, uh, Cyril Radcliffe, who was in charge of the Boundary Commission, I think there were very arbitrary ways in which the boundary was uh, uh, delimited. Uh, and as a result of it, there were huge migrations of populations which were on the other side of this boundary. Uh, and because of the fact that communal rioting had started actually in 1946 in Calcutta, mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that set a spiral of communal violence on both sides. So I, I, I give a lot of responsibility to, to the way it was done. The, the partition lines were drawn both on the east and the mm -hmm. west side. Mm -hmm. uh, so so, so that, that's, that's, that's a primary factor. I'm not sure historically at what uh, 
uh, my colleague from the, from the Pakistani side said that it was particularly by individuals like Nehru or Mountbatten. I think there was a general pressure after the Second World War for the British that this was becoming too much of a burden to hold on to its colonies. And that is probably objective uh, and even a geopolitical factor uh, which led to this haste in drawing the boundaries. Yeah. Perhaps we have to factor that in as well. Well, anyway, that, that was 70 years ago. And during the 70 years time, there have been numerous efforts. For instance, in January 1948, the UN Security Council adopted a resolution establishing a uh, commission, a UN commission for India and Pakistan to mediate the dispute. There was a genuine effort by the UN and the international community set to settle the issue, but the plan failed to be uh, implemented. Mr. Harley, uh, what do you think was the window of opportunity that was missed during that uh, uh, effort of uh, mediation? Well, uh, despite the fact that we have had uh, three wars and we, ha we have been on the brink of war a number of times, uh, as when uh, General Parvez Musharraf was the president of Pakistan, he visited India, and, uh, he had a summit at Agra, and it was assumed that he had an out-of-the-box solution and probably will be able to resolve Kashmir. But unfortunately, uh, hardliners prevailed, uh, and uh, these, uh, that was the chance which was missed. After that, in 2003, we managed to have a ceasefire on the line of control, which helped pretty well till 2014. That was when Narendra Modi, the current Prime Minister, took over. And I do not know what is his agenda, but since then there has been ceasefire violation. It is going on tit for tat because once India violates, Pakistan retaliates. We, uh, it is difficult to, uh, you know, uh, keep quiet about it. And that is the reason why the tension has prevailed. Well, I wanted to come to this later, but since uh, Mr. Hali has already mentioned it, so Mr. Aneja, what, is, uh, what has been the reason behind the failure uh, round after round between India and Pakistan to resolve this issue bilaterally. I mean, this uh, cease, ceasefire we heard talking about uh, in 2013, how come it didn't hold? Was there a lack of political will on both sides? No, it, it's, it's very interesting. I think we got to, I would just pick on uh, uh, Mr. Hali's other point, uh, which is about the Agra summit and what followed, which was basically in 2005, uh, 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 this is post Agra summit, when uh, former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh and Pakistan's uh, President Pervez Musharraf, they had come to a formulation, and it was uh, in the public domain, that we would resolve the Kashmir issue uh, by an uh, innovative way, which was to have soft borders. That is, you do not firmly define the boundary. The existing line of control becomes uh, the de facto boundary, and there is people to people exchanges, trade, etc., uh, families re reuniting, and that would be how a uh, pragmatic solution to, be uh, to this crisis can be found. I think that's still a great idea. That's an idea which needs to be revisited, and uh, the time has come that, that, that we do do. We mm -hmm. do that. Mr. Hali, uh, how do you, what is the Pakistani position towards this idea? And uh, if it has not been accepted, what are the reasons behind it? And if it has been otherwise, uh, what are the reasons? also well basically you see uh we are living now in an age where confrontation is uh, no longer the order of the day. And we have to take a leaf uh, from China, which has uh, set the record for uh, trying to uh, improve its relations with its neighbors because we cannot rise to our true potential unless uh, we sink our differences, however deep they may be, and unless we talk to each other. But unfortunately, at the moment, uh, we have a very hard line uh, r rulers, the Bharatiya Janta Party in India, which uh, uh, has uh, which does not give any quarter. I, uh, uh, when I say that, I do not give the full blame to the Indians. There are some people, non-state actors on the Pakistani side, who have also been uh, provoking India by some uh, unprecedented attacks, which have uh, set the you know tone uh, from uh, talking to each other to uh, actually a, ho a hostile attitude. So, uh, what can be done now? is that if both sides, they sit down and they talk to each other and they are convinced that co dropping confrontation and instead uh, we de rely on cooperation, that is the only way we can move forward and that is the only way which is the future for the people of not only India and Pakistan but the entire region. Yeah, yeah. Well, indeed, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, said in his Independence Day speech that bullets or abuse won't solve the Kashmir issue. Love will. 
Uh, but Mr. Aneja, what do you think is his real message? Because we have seen some conflicting signals somehow uh, coming from Mr. Modi towards the Pakistani counterpart. He invited Nawaz Sharif to attend his inauguration, but he also refused last year to attend a summit of the SARC, which is a South Asian country's platform in Islamabad. So what exactly is Modi's contribution to the issue here? Well, there's a certain context in which Modi operates. Is, is now taking his positions on this issue. Now, uh, we were just talking about the 2005 and you asked me why did it did not hold. There was one very important incident which happened which sort of derailed this process and that was the Mumbai attacks which our Pakistani colleague has also mentioned about non-state actors, etc. Now, that uh, we have still not got a closure to that. That was a straightforward case of terrorism where innocent people have been killed uh, in, in, in hundreds and uh, in a very horrific way. Uh, the Pakistani investigators have done a commendable job so far to, 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 to nail down and, and to bring the perpetrators to justice. But we're still not, the closure has not come. These people are still going around, they're still at large. So I think if Pakistani side moves on the Mumbai side, Mm -hmm. I'm not talking of terrorism in general, which is important, but it, I'm talking to something very specific. Yeah. Then that will give a lot of opportunities for people who want to normalize relations. I coming, see. Coming to Narendra I see. Modi. I have, I have really 20 seconds to give to let Mr.